Okay. <laughs> I'll let you start. Okay, that great. way I have a model great, to go great, off great. of. Um, I'm Ethan Philbrick. I'm um, a composer and a writer, and I um, am here because I have a new piece that I've written that is a choral setting of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Um, 19, there's, oh God, what century are we in? Good question for this piece, actually. Um, is uh, their Communist Manifesto from 1848. Um, and, and so it's a big choral setting of it. It's a piece for nine singers as a primary ensemble, and then me playing the cello, and then um, a volunteer ensemble of like 30 singers that sit within the audience. And, um, and it's happening on Sunday at 5 p.m. for its curveball. Wonderful. I can't wait to hear more about it and learn more about it. My name is Alice Tessier. I am a singer and flutist, um, particularly with the International Contemporary Ensemble down in Brooklyn. Um, and as of last fall, joined the faculty here in the Faculty of Arts and Science in the Music Department, um, where I'm sort of overseeing some of the performance activities. And I've gotten a chance to perform a little bit at Skirball. I was in David Lang's um, Whisper Opera last winter, which was a really wonderful experience to kind of um, exit the arts and science silver building and into a stage kind of situation. And I wonder if you've had experience um, performing here at Skirball before and what your experience has been like, yeah. or if this is your first time. Yeah, this is my first time um, performing at Skirball. I I did my graduate training and my UN performance studies, so at Tisch, um, but which is a, as a department is primarily focused on theoretical training, and so my work there was primarily as a writer, but I was performing there some, and there's a little studio space there that I've, I like, um, made some things in, um, but I've never performed at Skirball, and this has been, it's been really wonderful. It was um, Jay Wegman, the curator here, um, approached me like two years ago because I had done um, a series of workshop versions of this piece, which in, which consisted of a sort of very informal reading group that was also a chorus, where we'd get together and we'd read 19th century political texts, primarily the works of Marx, and um, as a way to sort of like disrupt our how we were thinking about the politics of the present, too, by sort of moving back to a, um, sort of dislocating ourselves in time. And so we were doing this, we were like getting together and reading, and then um, I'd write short musical refrains using texts from the pieces we read, and I'd teach them to everybody in the reading group, and we'd do this thing. And so Jay had um, heard about a workshop version of that that I had done, and that I would call Choral Marks sort of punny and fun, and, and we'd put red light bulbs in all the light, you know, like, and we'd, and we'd sit, and we'd put blankets on the floor, and we'd read Marx and sing together, and so I was doing these, um, and then he was um, starting to curate here, and this is, yeah, in the fall of 2016, was like, I think I'm thinking of doing a Marx festival, is there an evening-like version of this piece, and I was like, oh, absolutely, I've been working on it, like, this has all been a process to work on it, so, um, so yeah, so it was like two years ago, first thinking about performing at Skirball, and then it's been happening slowly since. And so I've been, I did one, um, I did a sort of strange little um, performance at Skirball two, a year ago, or sort of in, in there's this subterranean rehearsal room. Um, and we put on a, pe a performance there um, that was called Song in the Expanded Field. Um, which was thinking about sort of like artists not necessarily within music as a discipline, but who are working with song form. Um, and so that was, I did a little sort of, we like set up shop in Skirball's rehearsal room and put on a performance. Um, which seems almost maybe more appropriate yeah. somehow to be totally. under, underground. Totally, totally. And it's this, it's just, something. exactly, it's this, and it's this wonderful, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy room, but it's this, it's this room with a very slow, uh, low ceiling that, um, the performers as we got in there were like, oh my god, this feels like we're performing on a cruise ship. Because it's this like it's this low thing with no light, but it was and it felt like we were all like camping out on this sort of like post apocalyptic cruise ship, like performing for each other when we were really just like in the bowels of NYU and um, 
so yeah, so I did that like a year and a half ago, but then I've been rehearsing here for this past month um, and working with the tech crew here, and it's been like, it's been really wonderful. I'm, I'm used to performing quite small things that usually involve just like my body and what I can do in a space, and I bring sort of my tech in a bag and I set it up, and it's about the sort of precarious situation of being working in performance. Um, and so working in a bigger palette of like a theater with technical capacities with big ensembles thinking about sort of light and space and um, and that is is been really exciting and it's been my work with Scribble is like letting me do that right now. Terrific. Yeah, yeah. it's such a richness to have real experts in all of yeah. those domains actually yeah. putting their thoughts into a project yeah. and letting you sort of make decisions. Yeah, I can't imagine how how lovely this must be, kind of as a little celebratory cake at the end of your studies here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's gorgeous. Really. I'm super curious about this reading group. Yeah. Because a lot of graduate students do engage in sort of yeah, a um, little bit alternative kind of reading groups and study groups or whatever you might want to call them. And I'm curious as to what you mean exactly by read, mm. like when you were together. Reading seems to go directly into singing, so I wonder right. how much of that is actual sound making. Totally. And also just when you started this. Reading. Yeah, yeah, this was, it was a while ago. It was, I think it was like summer of 2014 or something. And it was um, when I was first starting to play with this. And it was, and so the format of it, it was like, yeah, it was June of 2014. And it was actually in relation, I like started throwing them at my party, and I remember sending out an email that was actually in relation to Pride Month. I was like, so it's Pride Month, there are lots of celebrations, and I've decided how I want to celebrate Pride this way is read Marks out loud with my friends at my apartment. <laughs> um, like, let's this, like, I'm, I'm going to come out as a leftist this summer, or something, you know, like, coming out as an everyday practice, and now it's a, a Marxist. But I, um, and so it started there, actually, and it was, and it was, then, Part of its formal constraint was just practical. It was that, like, I didn't want to make anybody read at home because I knew we were all really busy. Yeah. I was like, and I and I wanted it also to be, like, I have a lot of academic friends, but I also wanted artist friends and I also wanted organizer friends to come. So I was like, let's not actually, like, I had had sort of, like, theory reading groups before, but that was like, okay, go read Derrida and we'll get together next month come and back try to talk really about it. smart statement. Exactly, too. exactly. Yeah. And then everybody's just sort of like trying to outsmart each other and it's right. awful. And so I was like, no, let's just like pick a short, a series of short things and then get together and I'll have made copies and we'll sit around and we'll read things out loud and we'll do, and so then it was like, and so I was doing sort of little experimental ways to read things out loud. So we i do some where we'd go around in a circle and just trade sentences, and then I'd do ones where we would read it all together, but at different paces, so it was actually this like cacophonous sort of thing that we were reading, it was in the room, but you couldn't quite hear it, but you were reading. Um, then we'd do ones where we were like, yeah, like trying to read it as slowly as possible all together, and we'd do ones where we'd switch every word and try to go as fast as possible. So there was like, we were doing this like, I was already being like, how, yeah, what is sort of like a collective mode of reading and how do we do it in a way that is both about thinking about like the content of the work but also is making the work live in the room in a different kind of way. Um, and then out of that, at the end, I would also have like picked a sentence or something that I really wanted to um, intone in a different kind of way and I had like written some kind of refrain that we would then like sing together for a while with the idea also being that like music is a way to memorize or commit to memory or commit to our bodies in a different kind of way so like Absolutely. if and that was something that I was always having trouble with in grad school even in classes that were more sort of practically engaged like theor sort of cultural theory classes that maybe were really invested in political practice or artistic practice but we were reading in a way that we'd like I feel like we were losing the text really quickly like we weren't really like ingesting them and I was like no I want to be able to like be reading these things that feel so pertinent for my political practice and my artistic practice and like remember them and be able to be talking and be like oh yeah well but Mark said you know but and like just say it and like I wanted to have that so I was like oh music is a way to have that because it will like inscribe it differently and so yeah so it would be like 
yeah, I was reading like sort of like really early Marxist these like thesis on Feuerbach, the thesis on Feuerbach, which is like these like short little aphorisms that are sort of become grounding for his thought and his political practice. And there, you know, the last one is philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. That's the thing. And and then there's another one. Um, Existence is nothing but the ensemble of social relations. Is like sort of a statement of what ontology is. And like both of the, I was like, I love, and so I just like, I like know those because I have little musical refrains of them that I've like sung with a lot of groups, and they're there, and they're, and so then yeah, and so then it slowly grew over the past four years into this setting of the Communist Manifesto. As like okay, so if this is as a text, this is the one that's like, you know, it's I mean he is writing in a lot of different, Marx was writing in a lot of different registers, sometimes really in an analytic gesture, about like how do we understand capitalism so as to think beyond it. Um, and then sometimes in a really explicitly political gesture. And so, um, and the manifesto is like the most sort of explicitly political. It's like as a piece of writing, it's like wanting to do as much as it is wanting to describe mm -hmm. anything, you know, like actually writing so as to manifest, not writing so as to, um, Analyze or no, although there's so much analysis in it. But yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm going to try to set the manifesto in some strange way. And so I started going at it. Yeah, I'm really taken by um, what you said about the text living in a different way in the room. Yeah. And um, that's been something I've been very interested in in my own practice. Is, I mean, anytime you start reading philosophy. Yeah equals grad school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? And most of us are only exposed to it a little bit yeah, later in the game. Yeah, um, we start to think, like, why have I not been applying this to my practice? And then figuring out ways to apply it to your practice, um, and then thinking about what your practice actually is. And it's so interesting that when we read philosophy, it's usually in a comfy chair in our house or at our desk, completely silently taking it in for ourselves, maybe taking a note, maybe using a highlighter. <laughs> How much of that is really happening in our practice? Totally. Our practice is absolutely visceral, it's absolutely physical, yeah. it's fully repetitive. We're doing things over and over and over to internalize, to process through our body, to allow whatever's happening inside our body to reemerge in a new way, so that kind of that change is possible and, yeah. and happening no matter what. Yeah. Um, so I'm really taken by this concept of reading, not just for ingesting in an intellectual way, but actually viscerally experiencing um, almost a script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I take it, I assume, that you had read the manifesto before. Yes, I read it for the first time. I, I remember buying a copy at a thrift store maybe when I was like 18. Mm -hmm. Because I, I grew up I grew up um, on Nantucket Island. Okay. So hotbed for communist activity. No, no. Um, no, like, so like hyper-capitalist playground of the rich and famous, you know, for in the summer, not so much in this winter. So really a place of like really seeing stark class differential. Um, and may I ask, I yeah. hope it's not too personal, yeah. but w where would you position yourself in that cluster? Um, my family, family, yeah, my family had mobility within my lifetime. So like my dad is a writer who got successful when I was in high school. So my family was a year round community, like I grew up there year round. Um, and my mom is a lawyer, so in professional class. So we're, we were, did well. Um, my parents, yeah, are like, I was growing up in, I'd say, like a sort of upper middle class zone, and then with my dad's mainstream success as a writer, um, my parents are now wealthy. Um, but there are also people who think socially, totally. who are thinking artistically. Totally. So you were raised also with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and so on Nantucket, there was this like sense of like really experiencing what extreme wealth looked like. Yeah. Um, and then also. Um, and like seeing it so clearly and intimately and then um, having like a real sense of how unequally distributed it was and how actually sort of like um, violently um, 
infrequent it was able to be experienced and and that um, and like and so I think I was like having I like had a sort of like nascent class consciousness and so I would like I saw it at a thrift store and was like feeling that I want that and that there's some critical language for the like inequality of the world that I'm seeing that I need there but I got it and I didn't read it for a really long time and then in grad school um, I was studying here um, with uh, Jose Esteban Munoz who's a queer theorist um, who passed a few years ago but um, when he before he passed he was teaching a course, um, he was like a fantastic Marxist queer theorist, um, and, and he taught a course on the commons, um, and trying to like reimagine what, what it might be to try to think about the world in common as a way to critique capitalism and empire and things. And so, and I took that class and he taught the manifesto, and so we read the manifesto in that class as like one way to think about, um, what it's like to live in a world beyond privation and beyond um, profit and um, individual accumulation being the only guiding um, value of the world. And so I read the manifesto then, and I was like, oh. And then the next year I took a um, Marxist theory course. It was, I think it was called sort of Marxism in Form, which is, and so it was like a Marxist cultural theory course with mm -hmm. Jose again, and which is, and Marxism in Form is a great Frederick Jameson book this cultural theory but um and in that class I think we maybe read oh we read all of the Grandrisa which is this giant um, um Mar Marxist notebooks as he's preparing to write capital and um and so we and I was reading in that course um and Jose passed at the end of that during that course um so I think there is also part of my relation to wanting to read Marks out loud in a sort of like strange pedagogical way is maybe also about a kind of working through of the experience of loss of a teacher, um, and and how to keep a kind of like relation to leftist cultural theory that was also always about sort of like a weird queer gathering in a room, you know, like that was not just about not just an image of what we what leftist organizing already looks like, but it's also sort of like. Um, a weirder party or something, you know, like that kind of a legacy was also part of it, I think. So I take it that in those first courses where you were engaging with the text, that was that kind of, the previous uh, activity I was sort of describing, like yeah. the quiet, yeah. internalized, yeah. Yeah. individualized yeah. Um, exposure, yeah. first exposure. Yeah. Um, you've said so many things that fascinating to me uh, just in terms of how you engage with this particular text um, uh, how do I formulate this one thing you just said in terms of like what leftist groups might look like or do look like I wonder what your takeaway is about that, like what do we, what do we imagine the leftist group to look like, um, and maybe sound like, and in what way does your reading group slash choral endeavor slash ensemble now yeah, yeah. Um, differ from that, yeah. or maybe augment that? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's like an inherited image of the American left, which I think is actually it's a false image, but it's a false image that gets repeated a lot, but that. That it's a sort of like I mean like you know we could sort of like character it and it's like sort of a group of baby boomer white guys being like oh man why hasn't the proletariat revolution happened yet and like and oh and and blaming basically like identity politics for why the proletarian, like, the uprising hasn't <laughs> happened. You know, being like, ah, oh, like, feminism and, and anti-racist politics and gay liberation in the 60s and 70s, like, broke apart the unified left and, man, and just, like, mourning that loss since the 60s or something. You know, like, that's some image of, like, the, of, like, Marxist politics and that is, that is, like, class is the only antagonism that exists. 
every other social antagonism is a ruse and we just need to all organize around class antagonism and the big evil. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. Um, and that and that um, and they're just and so I have learned from political organizers and theorists and um, cultural workers who have just like a really strong account of why that is a ruse and that um, and that political struggles around racial oppression and gender depression and sexual oppression like um, are part of what a leftist practice might look like and have always been and like that's the leftist practice we want to look towards so so I think thinking about um, like coalitional movements that are articulating these really complicated entanglements of different kinds of social oppressions and histories of um, systems of domination and things that um, allow for a lot of disunity within the leftist movement, you know, like allow for a lot of different kinds of struggles that are co-articulating themselves, but not necessarily having to ever actually find a unified struggle, but are f learning from and sharing resources. Um, and so a kind of like the ways in which how a kind of class articulated leftist movement might be working with and alongside a feminist movement that's trying to think about um, race and gender in tandem and then also be thinking about that in relation to um, thinking about sexuality and gender transitivity and things like that. Like like how all these things might be co-articulating and working together. And so, and so yeah, it was really important for me is that I was like, okay, if I'm going to set the Communist Manifesto to music now, how it takes shape in a room needs to be viscerally making an argument for that kind of organizing structure. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. needs to be viscerally articulating the ways in which a call for like some kind of communism to come must be also a feminist and anti-racist and um, like articulation. Like it has to be that kind of a call or a voicing. And so, um, so that's happening both in like I think formal stuff. It's like how do I actually make sound? Like what kinds of sounds are happening? It's also happening in like who is singing it. Um, so wanting it. Um, so trying to find collaborators who are like working in decolonial political struggles and then also working in in feminist political movements and then but then are also musicians who are doing these things. So and bringing that kind of an ensemble together to try to then look back to 19th century Europe and the anti-capitalist struggles there to think about how they might resonate with these other like other fronts of um, struggles for a more um, equal and less violent world now. So it's it's like a tumultuous mix, you know, like it's a and that that and there's like disagreement within the ensemble. You know, it's not it's not, you know, we have like some like real labor organizer guys in the ensemble that we have people who are like um, have a lot of like critiques of how those forms somehow sometimes work and like and we're there trying to sing our way through it together. Um, so yeah. this is maybe where I'll yeah. poke the first please. Um, dagger. Yeah, please. <laughs> please, please. Um, just in terms of, um, and I think about this a lot too because yeah. as a member of an ensemble yeah. and you know we we um, take a lot of pride in the diversity of composers that we work with and the types of audiences that we might try to seek out, but in terms of our makeup, we're actually pretty unified. And that's been problematic for us to deal with and grapple with. Um, and in some ways, your endeavor has a little bit of an opposite problem, which is that the makeup of the ensemble has the diversity, has the struggles, has the um, different approaches to maybe a common desire for change. And yet, um, and I wonder how you how you feel about this, yeah. how you grapple with this. Yeah, totally. When we log on to the Skirball website, yeah. it's your name yeah, yeah, that is yeah. there, yeah. and it's also the name of Karl Marx. Yeah. Yeah. So those are two white men yeah. that are being kind of um, given this sense of authorship yeah. in a project that actually, the more I learn about it and the more I talk with you about it seems to have very little to do with authorship. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, there was a real question for me going into it being like, okay, 
do I, is the angle with this piece to, um, like, create something that is the uh, ideal form of non-privatized collective authorship thing? Like, do I do that? Um, is that the work I'm making here? And within the workshops of it, it fully was, and my name wasn't attached to it, and it was a workshop, and it, it wasn't, like it was that, the thing, yeah. and it was the thing. Um, and when I got approached to do something for, like, a proscenium stage, I was like, okay, there's a way in which I can keep doing that kind of work, but then the thing that felt interesting for me to do was to bring up the, that, like, to do something that actually would elicit this contradiction. Like would be like, and it would sh would be a thing that would actually be like in a weird contradictory tension between the like individual white male author and a collective of voices that was always like disorganizing that and and exceeding it. Um, but and and so I was like, okay, I'm actually. I think the goal for this because you know like we're at NYU the wonderful comic Bone Yang has the bit where he went to NYU and he says like he says like I went to um, the world's biggest real estate development agency <laughs> NYU or you know he's also says, the other one he says yeah 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 oh my god right yeah um, yeah or he says the um, he's like actually I went to NYU Tisch the world's um, biggest headshot manufacturer um, <laughs> but like but so I mean like you know like we're gonna perform an anti capitalist choral work at NYU, you know, like, like we're already going to be just dwelling in a ton of little contradiction. So what if we're also working with this one between the sort of like male author and the more distributed ensemble? And so, so I think like that it is like eliciting some ambivalence about that and like a critique of authorship and a critique of me as author. I'm like down for that to be one of the questions people are coming to it with that are like, why is your name on this when it's like clearly this like collective of voices? Like that, if that question is getting asked and people are wanting to push on that, that would be exciting for this piece for me. Uh-huh, okay. You know, like like I would want to be It is one of the that. outcomes you are hoping Totally, to yeah, yeah, to be like, why? And like, to be like, and this piece doesn't have an easy relationship to Marx either. You know, like we also, and I think that really happens formally within the piece, like our relationship to the text is not always with it. We're also um, like really ripping at it and tearing it to shreds orally. You know, like there, uh -huh. they, there's, it's not just like, but ah, it's like also, there's some really crucial moments in it where it's very illegible what the text is. So it's not, it's not a, um, I tend to agree with a lot of his analyses of how capitalism was working in the 19th century. You know, like I'm like, I'm, I'm also very pretty with it. Um, but then in some really crucial moments, um, we're not. not a sure, and it's also yeah. worth remembering this was like a really young guy yeah. that hadn't had a whole lot of professional experiences and yeah. was critiquing the whole system he was just yeah. starting to engage in, which you know can be analogous to you or I and, uh, right. and the kind of problems we find within that too. Um, yeah, and I think we, we do operate under much, much larger structures that where that question and that maybe problematic isn't posed. Um, I certainly know, bringing it back to the, the problems that we face in our own group, mm -hmm. like, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of this stuff if we didn't have the label of mm -hmm. the, the ensemble on it that has right. a track right. record totally. that, you know, totally. has met a certain... Um, qualification of success and and therefore has resources both financial and um, social uh, to be doing work like this yeah. so I mean yeah. we have to understand also the complexity of all of that um, switching gears now also back into your processing of in some way like grief and transcendence mm. uh, of sort of a pupil um, mentor relationship, particularly around Marx and particularly around maybe your um, identity versus your intellectual self. Um, how has, just even in like really layman's terms, how has 
interpreting it through your body and, mm. and allowing the sounds to live there. And I'm also making the assumption that you work with it in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's the Samuel Warner translation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how has that? How has that felt? How has that transformed your relationship to the text? How has that transformed yeah. your relationship to yourself? Yeah. Um. I. I don't. The what starts coming up for me and thinking about it, it's like, um. I so my training is primarily as a cellist. Mm -hmm. Um. And I and I sing. It's gonna really get biographical, but I I sing I sing a lot as a kid, and I was really sort of like a singer and a and an instrumentalist. And it was the thing, and then um, I I got like just like very severely bullied in middle school, um, and was just like experienced a lot of physical violence for a year or so, and it was all centered around um, how my um, voice exposed me as like a sexual and gender deviant. You know, it was all it was all that I was gender somehow not gender non conforming through my vocal performance and it was like totally unacceptable to the sort of young toxic males at Nantucket Middle School. And so I was I just like experienced a ton of physical violence and it was always um, because of my voice in some way and my voice like um, exposing me as as um, as different. And so and then I like developed like a ton of dissociative capacities for that like for dealing with that and um sort of like didn't actually address it and I like vowed I like went on a vow of silence that I was never gonna like speak in school because it had like done all these things to me and then I like and so I just like made the cello all the time, the cello all the time and I was a cello for a little while and like um and so there's something about but then for the past like four or five years I've been really wanting to work voice and really wanting to work in vocal scenarios and I think it's like it's so and it's and there's so much pain and fear for me in vocalizing in front of other people but then I've been asking myself to do it a ton and learning about it and I feel like and there's something about um and there's just a politics to all of that and there, it's like such an intense like the bodily experience of like singing without fear uh is, is there such a thing I don't think so, but I think, definitely don't think so, but there's something of, like, the, there's, like, a less fearful mode. There's, like, something where it's, like, yeah. you're not imagining your own persecution immediately or something, you know? Like, like there's something, and, and feeling what that feels like in my body, um, and feeling what that might feel like when that might be also about a political articulation. Which maybe you feel more confident. Yeah. Articulating, actually. Totally. And I think, and I, so I think there's this thing of, like, um, feeling able to, like, voice a critique of a system, voice a critique of, um, a practice, um, and all the meanings of voicing that's, like, grown in this project for me, and I think I was even, yeah, I was thinking like, about that today a little bit. Like, I sing a little bit in it. And, um, and I was, like, and there's, there is some kind of, like, isomorphic relationship between the content of the text and what it's like to sing it. And there's something, and it's, like, a practice I've wanted to be in. I don't, I don't quite know, I don't know, like, I don't have, like, the, the answer of, like, what it's done for me, but I think, but it's, like, I, like, want to be in it. I think answer is the fact that you've made this piece yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. in a lot of ways and, and you do participate in some ways in yeah. vocal yeah, 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 vocalizing I do. Yeah. Um, in some ways like this post-Trump election yeah. period has been a time for a lot of people to decide that they have voice you know? right. and um, in a way that maybe, maybe we had sort of started sitting on our hands a little bit um, but it's interesting to me to hear that this project was started far before that, even before maybe like that orange hair became part of yeah, the he political wasn't in sphere. The, yeah, it wasn't in the political sphere. Yeah. And we could yeah. I remember even thinking, like, I've never thought about this human being and I, I see him emerging in my life and I can I can forget him very soon. Yeah. And unfortunately that was not, <laughs> not the case. Yeah. Um, but what I find interesting is that you have already been developing this project. And we touched on a little bit also um, 
the sort of intersectionality of, of the struggle, so to speak. And, um, and there are a lot of, I think there's a lot of debate about how to do that well and how to do that effectively and how to actually retain our sort of um, common struggles as we're starting to get stronger inside of our individual um, sort of identity groups and where we feel comfortable speaking and regaining our voice. Um, and so I see, I see this project that you're presenting as a sort of attempt to show us that and also infiltrate the audience with a little bit of um, maybe encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wonder, I, I wonder how you are imagining um, modeling a sort of ideal world or some sort of ideal future through, through this performance. Yeah, I think... Um yeah, I think I think one thing. Well, part of it is like. In this moment of like sort of intensified violence of, the, that and and sort of like intensified, um, that was it was all sort of like they're all ongoing structures of violence. You know, like the relationship to. Um, immigration that has been so violent under Trump is also like a it's a it's an intensification of something that was already ongoing. You know, like all of that, and so like. And so I think in this moment of like heightened responsiveness to like an intensified political regime, um, I think it feels very helpful to like look back to like a long ongoing history of resistance, to not get too only responsive to like the workings of Trump and his regime. And so, yeah, it's like, triggered. Yeah, and like but like be thinking about like the ongoing struggles that were now having to more like intensified responses to things, but are actually we're building on like really long histories. Absolutely. And so I think there's something that's like I want to like get a big group of people together and intone marks, you know, like because there's like it will do something about being like okay, like, let's just attach to whatever we might want to attach to from this, like, 19th century moment as ena to enable a sense of, like, how we're stepping into, like, a bigger stream in terms of, like, resisting violent structures. So I think um, that's part of it. And then the other thing for the performance, there's, some, like, one thing I've been wrestling a lot with, like, in sort of directing and um, composing it is like how ideal of a world I want to make on stage. Because mm -hmm. I know I have a lot of friends who make work where it feels like the ensemble, you know, like is like giving us this sort of like idea. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I decided I didn't want that. I want us to never not keep feeling the conditions of our alienation. So I guess I'm just like exposing myself as Brechtian. But like, but, but like, I, like I didn't want to solve it ever. Or like suddenly be like, and here we all are all together. You know, like like I didn't want to quite get there, so there was a capacity to like always like for it to not feel done at the end, or not have just sort of like let us feel like we overcame it That's or something. Moment. Yeah, and yeah. so and so I think there's this thing of like I am staging a kind of collectivity that I'm very interested in and do think is ideal, but I didn't want it to ever quite fully go there. Yeah, it's a process, yeah, a product. Totally. Yeah, so it's like, and so we're almost there, but not quite there, and and I, so I hope that people come, and then there's this sense of, like, some things were awakened, but um, it doesn't feel like the work has already been done, and then we leave being, like, with the, you know, the leftist question, what is to be done? And maybe each person in that audience has a different... Totally. And there's the, all the capillary responses, you know, like that it then goes out. And which I think is much stronger. I'm teaching a course this semester on repetition, mm. which sounds very boring. Um, but I think of repetition as amazing. being yeah. crucial yeah. in change making yeah. and in revolutionary practice. And so you're you're engaging with kind of a text that has been yeah. cycling for generations and generations of thinkers and workers. Um, artists and kind of using it to see in 2000, late 2018, what the change is this time. I think is very fascinating. Cool. I'm so looking forward to hearing oh, good. the performance great, great. and seeing how it all comes about and yeah. having more ideas pop into my yeah, head. Yeah, I'd love to keep talking about it. Yes, and yeah. having many more conversations great. with you. Yeah, please, thank you. Great.
pleasure to speak with you.